Welcome to season two, episode seven of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. My name is Dr. Kirk Megu, and I'm the Public Relations Officer of the United National Congress, the official opposition party in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a unique venture, streaming simultaneously from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, Dehradun in India, and San Francisco in the United States. We speak with people from around the world, trying to understand different issues and problems relevant to my own country, Trinidad and Tobago, but also to people in sometimes very similar and sometimes very different situations or cultures, histories, politics, sociology. The goal is to learn from each other, to build networks, to widen our perspectives, and to work for solutions in our distinctive contexts. Today's episode is Constitutions of Guyana versus Trinidad and Tobago, Ethnicity, PR, Democracy, and Social Cohesion. Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana are two Caribbean countries in the Southern Caribbean. They share significant similarities, such as being former British colonies, historically dominated by sugar plantations, slavery, and indentureship. They are multiracial, but uh, descendants, uh, but they're dominated by descendants of Africans and Asian Indians, although there are many other ethnicities as well. Uh, both are developing countries that face political, social, economic, and other challenges. Ethnic based politics has been prominent in both countries, which has sometimes been problematic in terms of social cohesion and democratic accountability. Trinidad and Tobago achieved independence from the UK in 1962 and Guyana in 1966, four years later. However, the constitutions that they were left with under British rule were radically different, although it's just a four year span. The electoral system, uh, proportional representation in Guyana versus first past the post in Trinidad was a major difference. Uh, Guyana also was firmly caught in the rivalries of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the USA, which affected its development greatly and largely negatively, in my view. You can hear from our guest uh, and his view as well. But the Trinidad and Tobago uh, was generally more stable and prosperous, but this may change now that Guyana has a new oil and gas industry that may be among the world's largest, while Trinidad and Tobago's over century old oil and gas industry has been facing many years of decline and decay. Particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, constitution reform issues have been on the table for about two decades, almost continuously. It will be instructive to compare the country's very different constitutions and see how they have helped or hindered progress in areas such as economic and social development, and democratic representation and accountability. I'm joined by two experienced guests from both countries, Ralph Ramkaran from Guyana and Timothy Hamill Smith from Trinidad and Tobago. Ralph Ramkaran is a politician and lawyer who served as Speaker of the National Assembly of Guyana from 2001 to 2011. He comes from a family with a long political history in Guyana. Timothy Hamill Smith is also a lawyer and was a former president of the Senate in Trinidad and Tobago from 2010 to 2015. He also comes from a family with a long political history in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm honored to have both of you gentlemen on the program. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. Very Thank much. you very much. Good. All right. So let's Great start off the program uh, with you please giving us a bit of your background and how your interest in constitutional matters became sparked. We'll start off with Ralph and then Timothy. Uh, the Constitution of Guyana is a very long story and unfortunately there's not enough time to, uh, to relate it here on your program. But we inherited, like Trinidad and Tobago, the colonial type independence constitution that was 
very much similar in the entire British Commonwealth with, as you mentioned, the big difference of the voting system of proportional representation, which was imposed on uh, Guyana for a specific purpose of removing the government of the People's Progressive Party, which was seen as a pro-communist government, and at that time would have um, taken Guyana close to Cuba, according to the United States. So if, if, if I may just uh, in, interrupt with a little fact here, most people don't know that in 1953, Guyana was the first, uh, had the first elected um, communist socialist state in the Western Hemisphere, even before the, the um, Cuban revolution in 59. Yeah, so I mean, it's a very interesting factoid that people don't uh, understand. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, Guyana had, Guyana had its first elections on a universal adult suffrage in 1953. And the same people who won the elections in 1953 and were removed from office uh, three months later by the British government, by, by mm -hmm. sending the British military, um, the same people were in office in 1964, <laughs> Cherry Jagan and the People's Progressive Party, when the constitution was changed. So my um, so I was I was around. I'm, I'm not as old as I look, but I was around at that time. Um, in 1964, I was a teenager, and there was a great deal of violence in the country between 1962 mm -hmm. and 1964. All instigated now as a matter of of historic record. A books have been written out of the United States, uh, um, detailing the CIA's role and so on in these disturbances. Yeah. Lots of people were killed and so on. Anyway, we came and we got the constitution in 1964, but the PNC, led by Forbes Barnum, came into office and he changed that, he rigged the elections in 68, 73, and in 1980, but he altered the constitution in 1980 to make Guyana into a presidential system. That constitution, in, in its essence, remains the same today. Though there that have is the been, um, cooperative uh, republic, right? Is, that's what that, it was called? That, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That constitution remains in place today. It named Guyana the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. And um, it, we have a presidential system. Um, so while Guyana has close resemblance to Trinidad historically, uh, in terms of slavery and dentorship and, and, and the social and cultural um, um, relations and, and, and developments. But politically, we have we have we have we're very different from each other. We we we, we are developed quite differently. Guyana came out of violence. The current situation. Uh, we had, for example, a serious problem of attempted rigging of the elections just last year. Uh, Trinidad doesn't have that problem and doesn't have a problem of violence though ethnic politics is prevalent in both countries. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I mean it's well documented. I mean, it's, it's not an allegation. Uh, the, the voter fraud that, that has existed throughout, um, uh, especially from the 68 to uh, 88 period. Um, 85. Before the 85, 90, just before 90, the 92. 90. Yeah, 92 was the first free and fair. But yeah, you know, I, and there were things like, election martyrs, for example. I mean, I, I've seen the monuments to the people that have been, that were killed by the security forces trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, get the vote, uh, you know, uh, because they were being suppressed and prevented from voting and so forth. Yeah. Were, you, were you part of that? I mean, you, you said you were a teenager in the 60s, so. Um, I was, I, by 1973, when that event occurred, yeah, I had, I was in, I had become an adult by then. I was in Guyana. Yeah. I, I just returned in 1973. I just returned from the UK, and uh, I be, just started law practice. The, I came in January, and, and those events took place in July. And actually, very it is it is little known that I was a a, a, a member of the elections commission uh, for the 1973 elections. I was a member okay. of the commission, and, and you know. They witnessed a lot of the skullduggery and the elections rigging that went on, the violence. 1973 was the first elections that the military invaded 
the polling stations, remove the ballot boxes forcibly. And that was what caused the shooting in, in Borbis in 1973, because wow. people blocked the way, people blocked the path of the military vehicle. And oh. uh, they, shot, they shot their way out and three people were killed. So, as you, so you were a part of the election, was it an election and boundaries commission or just the elections commission? It, just, it was just an elections commission. Elections right. and boundaries, it, it adopted, well, we don't have boundaries, but it's... Um, oh, right, I forgot. PR, yeah, we have, we have registration, the registration. Yes. Code. It became the elections and registration commission, although it doesn't carry the name registration. But right. it's responsible for the registration of voters. So, so you were on that commission in what capacity? As a uh, with the I was party? a member. Of the, I was nominated by the opposition. Right. So, yeah. so, so I, I'd like, I'd really like to find out. Uh, uh, so, you were on the commission. You witnessed voter fraud and tam tampering and military intervention. What, what did you do? What did you say? What did the government say to you? What did they do to you? Did you did you lodge a protest? What how what, what was that like? Uh, <laughs> Guyana was <laughs> Guyana was a frightening country at the time. People were very afraid to do anything. Not that I was, or else I wouldn't have been publicly associated yeah. with the opposition. But the only thing that was possible at that time was to speak publicly. Now they had a rule that members of the commission were not supposed to speak to the press. Well, of course, the only way that the opposition members of the commission were able to get their um, get their view out and to resist and to oppose was as soon as the commission was finished its business was to go and report to the public, which we did, which I did. Uh, incidentally, Janet J. I had succeeded Janet Jagan, who was a member of the Elections Commission for the 1968 elections. Right. The wife. So she, um, she, I followed. Her I followed her pattern. We did the same thing. We went to the public, castigated the decisions which were taken, and um, and that was how we made our our protests. Mm -hmm. uh, what in fact happened was the army seized the ballot boxes. They were wooden ballot boxes at the time, and we now know, of course, that they took out the bottom of the boxes. So the padlocks on the top of the boxes, which covered the um, yeah. which covered which uh, yeah, sealed it. it from being yeah sealed it. Mm -hmm. So these boxes were made of wood and nails. So they took out the, the the bottom of the boxes and they had the pre-prepared ballots. They took out what they wanted from the boxes and inserted the ballots that they had already. So it was very difficult to to um to to, to find evidence that the boxes were tampered with, but. The boxes were seized and they were taken into the GDF, the, that's the army's head, the compound in 1980. Wow, wow, wow. Well, well, let's, let's go to out. Timothy. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you well, had a question, well, Timothy? Is there anything about the presidential system or the proportional representation voting system that lent itself to, uh, to make it more easy to rig an election yes yes the, the proportional representation system made it far easier because remember in constituencies there is a, a kind of um uh, 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 the constituency is self-contained so to speak so yeah. people vote in a constituency for a candidate and they gather at the place of polling and they um and the votes are counted and the announcement is made in their television cameras and so on. I don't know if that's the way it's done in Trinidad, but I see that yeah. in the UK and other places. That's right. That's how it's done in the UK. The television cameras and the winners are announced and all of that. Well, the proportional representation system, there, under that system, there are no constituencies. Mm -hmm. So you can remove the ballot boxes later on after 1973. It was too cumbersome to take the ballot boxes to the GDF compound, which is in Georgetown. So they had them in, we have 10 regions in Guyana. And, and, and just to be clear for the international viewers, the GDF is a Guyana, Guyana Defense Force, the army, which yes. really shouldn't be having the election boxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So they took them at these 10 um, counting places in the country, the 10 regional offices. And that was where they, they, they kind of decentralized the rigging. And for the, seven, for the 80 and 85 elections, that, that's what happened. Right, right. Yeah, because, I mean, we have 41 constituencies in Trinidad, which is very small. You know, like UK has, what is it, 700, something around that. But it's, so it's basically 41 separate elections here. That's why you call it general elections. So, yes, yeah. so whereas in, on the PR, it's one election a national. So, yeah, so it's easier to rig one election than 41, let alone 700. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. It, it, yeah, that's question. why I raised it. I mean, yeah. when you look at what... Uh, the Wooden Commission, which was around 1973, mm -hmm. what they had recommended for Trinidad back then was a mixed form uh, of proportional representation. So you, yeah. you would have first pass supposed in each of the constituencies, but then you would have a, a PR element where you got a percentage of seats that are equivalent to the percentage of the popular vote that you got. And that's what we have in the local government system now. Yeah. Well, you know, seem to counteract the potential for for. Um, that's right. That's right. But you know, but it's, it's, about for, for it's very job. that's very uncanny because, you know, in nineteen we had a process of constitutional reform in nineteen ninety nine to two thousand. I was the chair of the constitutional reform committee, okay. um, and a member of the opposition, now deceased, um, Haslin Paris. Uh, who would have been a former deputy prime minister and so on. He had a lot of positions in the PNC government during its time in office. He was the secretary to the commission. So we got on very well. And the commission was a mixed group of people, civil society, po politicians and so on, religious people and so on. So we came up with a report and we recommended that the system should have an a, an a geographical element. There have been long been calls, and I've written extensively on it, to alter the system to allow for some for constituencies and a, another set of seats, which would what which we call top up seats. Mm -hmm. Now, the government agreed. The government and opposition agreed to the proposal. But in 2002, they were discussing it in 2001, and elections were due in 2002. And they, um, or they were discussing it in 2000, in 2000, 2001 were elections, I believe it's 2001, yes. Yeah. And they didn't have time. So they decided that the 10 regions in Guyana should be the 10 constituencies, and that 25 of the 65 seats should be elected from the region and any discrepancies which arose between percentage of votes and percentage of seats would be corrected by the allocation of the 40 remaining seats, which are top-up seats. But it hasn't proved to be effective because nobody, um, it hasn't given the kind of geographical representation. Nobody knows who their MPs are. Yeah. So we are, have been arguing for an expansion of that system, which is already provided for in our constitution, that um, the constitution allows parliament to demarcate half of the 65 seats into first past the post constituencies, uh, if parliament so decides. So we can have 32, cons 32 or 33 constituencies, and the rest of the um, seats will be the top up seats to be allocated to the parties to make up any disproportionality. The question is that we believe there can be more, more there can be more like 50 or so. You don't need you don't need so many seats. 15 or so top up seats will be sufficient. But what we have what we we have we're, we're fighting for what is easily um, put can be easily put in place. There is a constitution provision. All we need to do is the um, demarcate the thirty-two, pass a law and demarcate the thirty-two constituencies. And very interesting, in 1964, in Guyana's first past the post, uh, last first past the post, there were thirty-two constituencies. Right. So that it will not be difficult to demarcate these constituencies. Obviously, the boundaries will change. There have been 
movement of population and so on. But there is a basis in which the government and opposition can agree to the 32 constituents. But it's a, it's a very big uphill battle. Just let me end with this one point. Mm -hmm. Several years ago when COP got the percentage, the highest, the first elections they contested, mm -hmm. when they got the first... Um, yeah, in 2007, um, they got about 20-something yes. percent of the vote. Yeah, they, they, they got no seats. Yeah. There's a big conference in Trinidad. I can't remember who organized it. There's a guy who um, who later on became a minister in the UNC government, in the next UNC government. Um, he's a businessman. Um, and I was invited to to talk to that conference on um, on um, on the elect well, on the electoral system. Mm -hmm. And I I pushed that, of course, but it didn't take root. I said I said my argument was that the COP would get a number of seats and be represented in parliament. But yeah. I think the COP eventually came together with the UNC and, and the whole thing uh, fizzled out. Yes, yes, yes. There was that coalition after. And I mean, so that brings us to Timothy Hamill Smith, who has experience uh, with that ex um, uh, development. Uh, yeah, so j I, I know this is your second time on the program, but for many viewers, it might be the first time uh, seeing you. So if you could just um, you know, give the listeners a bit of your background and how your interest in constitutional matters in Trinidad became sparked. Yeah, so Tobago, I, I should... I'm a lawyer by profession. Mm -hmm. I, I, in fact, qualified in 1973 um, and started practice then, which is the same time as Ralph mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, similar levels of antiquity, as it were. <laughs> um, uh, my, my my father was in politics uh, into the forties up to the fifties. Um, he, he was the mayor of Port of Spain at one point. He was considered radical. Con con he was very friendly with Chedi Jaga, so mm -hmm. he was considered communist at that time. He certainly pushed a very socialist um, head and <coughs> commanding heights of the economy and all all those sort of things that come with it. I, I don't pretend that I followed in that those footsteps, but mm -hmm. certainly the fact that you have parents in politics, I think, or, or in law, because my father was a lawyer too, the children tend, you know, because you're in that, not because it's a, a thing to do with genes, I think, but if you're in that milieu, as it were, you tend to, to unconsciously for that matter. In 1981, I would have become involved in, in active politics. And back then it was the ONR, the Organization for National Reconstruction, which was led by Carl Hudson Phillips. And, you know, where Ralph just left off, it's a good jumping off point to indicate that in fact, as far as 1981, there was a group of people who were gaining up to 22 or 23% of your popular vote but resulted in no seats. So that happened in 81. It happened in 91 again, and it happened in 2007. And to my mind, you know, if 23% of your population don't have representation, then your democracy is flawed. And you, you need to find a system which would allow that representation because and, you've and if I may, if I may, Timothy, uh, Tobago too had a very uh, even more egregious situation, right? Um, exactly. Uh, yes, when the TOP, uh, you know, they won thirty nine percent of the vote. Can you imagine thirty nine percent? This is for the Tobago House of Assembly, uh, and got no seats. There were twelve seats, twelve divisions. And therefore, what you had was a one-party state, if you like. And it was very embarrassing. Everybody was looking around. Could we get the president to do something? We need some opposition. Um, but more than, more than that, when you look at how it's, Tobago is overlaid, is that the THA at that time um, employed maybe 60% of the, the people, which actually matched exactly how the voting turned out. So a sort of 40, 60. So if you weren't supporting the party that won, it meant that you were relegated in terms of your, your ability to get work. And 
You know, mm -hmm. can you imagine the kind of repercussions? And of, of course, Tobago is now facing that same sort of difficulty because this time around, there was an equal number of votes. So they couldn't, they couldn't um, appoint ahead of the Tobago House of Assembly. And we're still with a caretaker government over there. Mm -hmm. And of course, lots of action in the parliament to find something for it. But if we get back to, to, to the whole Trinidad and Tobago, and I mentioned that, you know, a flawed democracy, in, in my view, when 23% of your population go unrep unrepresented for as long a period as since 1981. Uh, uh, and they're there, they haven't disappeared. They may not be a vehicle that they've supported since 2010, but those that same group of people are there. They haven't gone away and, and they remain unrepresented. Either they don't vote or they will vote for a party that is not one of the, their first choice. And therefore, to my mind, it's crying out for a, what I would like to think of a mixed form of representation. First pass, suppose, plus PR. We, are, we have an advantage to Guyana in the sense that I know that Ralph was saying they have some pre-existing um, constituencies, but very often, you know, that's where the allegations about gerrymandering and so on come in. But at least Trinidad has 41 recognized constituencies. You can retain those and then have a number of seats that you gain by proportional representation. My own view is that we would be better off having a single house of parliament. I don't see in a small country of 1.5 million people that you could possibly have a need for two houses of parliament, each to do pretty much the same, the same work. And therefore you're duplicating the exercise. Yes, I know there's talk, well, perhaps in the Senate, you have a more reserved type of uh, uh, position, but how it has actually worked out in practice, it's really, you have independent senators and you really have people following a party political line in the Senate. And you could form a single house and maintain, if you wanted, the independent senators in that sort of house of assembly, which is what Wooden would have called it. And he recommended a single house then. The starting point for me to determine what numbers you should have in your parliament really requires that you reflect on what does a parliament do? What is your role? So out of our parliament, we choose an executive. Um, I, I would like to think, you know, our governments have been too expensive and we should choose an executive limited to a number of say 15 uh, members of cabinet. The remaining would therefore be backbenchers along with your opposition, along with your independent senators. We tend to look at the parliament and think the only time that work is done is when as a, a debate is held. And that is part of it. But the far more important role is in fact in the committee system when you get to overview the actions of the executive and ensure that they're accountable and, and that everything is transparent and that you can in fact be looking at each ministry and each state enterprise as to how they're performing. What in fact happens right now, because we, uh, we just, there's such a large body that forms the executive, the number of, of parliamentary members remaining are very often not sufficient to run all of the committees that we would like. As a result, many members are, are members of the say of different committees and often have to ask for adjournments and nothing gets done because that goes back to the question, should you have full-time parliamentarians? Should this be your exclusive job? And if in fact, as it is in Trinidad, your main pay is coming from some secondary source because you have to earn a living, then where are you gonna focus your attention is it on parliamentary affairs or where you actually earn your income? And that's what you know the drawback is. 
because we really we need full-time parliamentarians we need them working you know at least five days a week attending to the business of parliament sitting in committee reviewing the executive and how they're performing and surely then you start to get far a far better outcome i mean we have the ludicrous situation where we in order to review legislation i, I don't know if you've ever looked in at our committee but there are only five or six people that really have an interest in going line by line and looking at the legislation and what should it contain as opposed to the what should be the you, you might consider the philosophy behind the legislation and yet you sit with these 40 members all just looking at legislation but none of them interested in the nitty-gritty of it and really you need a committee that's how it how it operates you know you know, in a more sophisticated jurisdiction, yeah. you form a committee, you look at it, you get those people on either side of it to actually focus on it. And, and that produces a far better result. Right. In fact, right. if once you do that, you could limit the, the debate, um, length of the debate in the parliament, because then you just focus in on what is the philosophy? Should we have this? We should have really a for most of our legislation, a cost-benefit analysis to understand what are, are the consequences, what are the expectations and goals that legislation is not just created in a vacuum. Yeah. It is intended for a purpose with an outcome. Uh, and can we ever measure that outcome until, until you become a serious country that yes. understands that what goes on in parliament has repercussions for the daily life of people yeah and in fact you know it, it becomes a farce it's yeah. a facade you have all the you know the trappings if you like of uh, of westminster system we do all those things but in fact there is no meat yeah. to what yeah. we really perform. And i mean right right now what's going on i mean is is a whole bunch of uh, a lot of controversy about with tobago uh, and with the way the parliament is, is operated and the speaker and, and, and the arbitrary changing of rules. And yeah, I mean, all, all, all this is, is really speaking to it. But I want to just point out some of the issues you raised, like about the bicameral and the unicameral, the one chamber, or the two chamber. I mean, in, before Eric Williams changed our constitution, which in some ways is parallel to the way Forbes Burnham changed the Guyanese constitution, um, the, we had a unicameral system. We had independent persons and uh, in, inside that unicameral system. Sure. Um, and so, so, so the, the, we, it, it, it won't be something, uh, you know, ahistorical to, to go back to that system. And the yeah. number of seats you mentioned is interesting because we, uh, Guyana has about, you know, we have about 50% more people than Guyana does. But we have less seats in our parliament. They is have 65, true? we have 41, and we have 36, and then yeah. 30 before, you know. I mean, uh, we really should have a, a much larger number of seats. And, and you know, and, and about, you know, you're talking about the, the JSCs. I mean, it's when the UNC came in government and we introduced the Joint Select Committees of Parliament to expand it, to have that accountability. And again, you know, uh, like More the kind than that, of, you, you put your independent senators as chairperson. That's right. Uh, and the right. PNM seem to take a different view. They see all these uh, yeah, as they, very they, they want cabinet things and, and prime ministerial control. control. That's all. And that's, that's so. How is the executive to review the executive? Is exactly. that the boss? Is that the, the definition <laughs> exactly. of the boss? Exactly. Um, I, I, I want to bring really in the issue of, of social cohesion um, right. because this is very important. In, in Guyana and you know the violence and so forth is mentioned there and then in Trinidad which has not ever gone to that level although we did have an attempted coup and there was a black power up, uprising but it's, it's not the same type of thing as, as Guyana uh, but uh, but still we have those problems and even right now the issue of Tobago and Trinidad is, is another issue um, you know so so there are issues in both countries uh, perhaps a different degree. And I mean, Guyana too, it's not only Africans and Indians. Guyana is called the land of six peoples. There, there, are, there are many peoples in Guyana as well. So uh, I'd like to, to get a sense from both uh, Ralph and Timothy, you know, so given the, the, the issues with social cohesion uh, in, 
in both countries and social harmony. Um, do, do you think that, that this is a matter that a constitution reform can help solve at all? Or is it far deeper that no matter what constitution change you put in, um, you know, uh, like we have a Westminster system in Trinidad, more or less, but it doesn't operate like the Westminster system because of, of how the, the, the culture of, of the politics has, has developed. So in other words, are the constitutional changes really, um, you know, essential to, to enhancing social harmony and cohesion? And, and if you think so, um, which, what types of changes do you think would be most important in that? Uh, so I'd ask Ralph, invite Ralph again, and then Timothy. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, the problems you described and the problems, issues that Timothy raised are identical to the issues in Guyana, um, with the Guyana parliament, everything in every detail, every single thing. Uh, we even have debates about an upper house and the, the answer to that question, quash the entire debate is, we have an elected house, lower house. Are you going to impose on that elected lower house a nominated upper house? That ended the debate for the time being. But every now and again, it raises its head. But the reform of the constitution is a very important aspect of a social cohesion. Uh, unfortunately, um, the, the, the politicians don't see it that way. We have, for example, the general perspective of people, which both sides kind of nominally support, is the president has too much power. We have an executive president. The problem is, how do you give the executive president less power? Executive presidents the world over are head of state, head of government, commander in chief of the armed forces. That is where they have their, uh, they, they, they get their power from. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is we see some, many of us here in Guyana see constitutional reform, changing the nature of the, of, of the government as a method to bring about social cohesion in Guyana. We can't resolve the ethnic problems between people socially. That will continue. But the, it is driven very, very much by and also is driven by the politics and the politics drives the, co the, the, the ethnic problems, the vice versa, they feed on one another. So we have always advocated, me and many others, the PVP at one time, the PNC in 2015, they call themselves APNU now, they propose in their constitution a government whereby, which will be comprised of the party winning the, the largest number of seats having the president presidency, the party winning the second largest number of seats having the prime ministership, and all parties having 30% or more votes sharing in the government in accordance with their, the proportion of their, of their votes. Now, I thought Nirvana is here, we're, we're ready, we're home. When they realized that the PNC at an elections because they started to become, you know, unpopular like many government after the, after the initial period. When they realized that they probably will come in at some point in time, second, they abandoned the process. But that is the process many people have been advocating. It's now no longer being advocated by our two main political parties. Jagan advocated it when his time, when he was in, just before he went, became political, uh, just became, became, just prior to him becoming president. But after he became president, the hostility was so great that it wasn't possible. So the PPP after Jagan never embraced what we call shared governance. PNC embraced it in 2015. Desmond Hoyt, the former leader of the PNC, embraced it in 2002. Um, the PNC had it in its manifesto and it never happened. So Guyana, in the meantime, what we can do is to rectify our parliament based on resolving the same complaints that Timothy mentioned, having MPs being 
um, full-time MPs doing more um, doing more with the committee system and, and so on in order to in, have the opposition more involved in in, 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 in in legislation and that kind of thing one way one way one possibility we have also talked about is excluding the executive from the parliament because the key issue in relation to the Westminster system is executive dominance of the parliament. Executive are members of the parliament. Under a full presidential system, uh, which Guyana doesn't have, we have a president, but is a president imposed on a Westminster system because our executive are members of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. And if you remove the executive, which is, you know, half of, of the parliament, um, you have more MPs who are available for service on in the committee system. So that's one possibility in which you can... And, and, and let me just those. expand that for our listeners who may not you know, be so familiar with constitutional systems. Like a, a presidential system like the United States, um, a, a secretary, which is like a minister, um, cannot be a part of the executive. In fact, if, if I mean, cannot be part of the legislature which is the Congress there. So if they are, they have to resign their seat because that separates the legislature and the executive. So ministers cannot be in parliament in a proper presidential system. But as, as, as Ralph is saying, you know, that's not happening in, in the Gu Guyanese situation. It's the president imposed on the Westminster system. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify that, Ralph, so you can continue. Well, that's, that's, I, I think a great deal can be done both in Trinidad and Guyana. Uh, even if you don't have the fundamental changes that I, we have been, some of us are advocating in Guyana, a great deal can be done with the parliament to improve social cohesion by giving the parliament and ordinary MPs more power and authority. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, well, that's interesting, and there's a lot of overlap, I'm, I'm sure, uh, Timothy. But let me hear you in terms of you know, social cohesion and harmony in Trinidad and whether constitutional reform can affect that or whether it's something deeper, you know, what, what are your views? Well, I think social cohesion is in fact the most important issue that would either help a country, any country for that matter, to attain its goals, its dreams, its vision. Um, and without that, then you, it's so hard to, to if you don't have a critical mass of people, and I put that, let's say it's 6% or 70%, following a particular vision, what we have is that simply for five years, uh, and we've pretty much sliced down the middle, that's the truth. I mean, one or two seats divide the government and the opposition. So you have half the country pulling in one direction and half the country pulling in the other direction. And the intent of whoever is the opposition is to make it ungovernable. That's your role as seen as Trin in Trinidad and Tobago. And that's, that therefore doesn't allow you to have harmony. It doesn't allow you to have a vision. And, and therefore we're not, so what do we do about it? And you're asking whether the constitution can do that. To me, a constitution is not just, ought not to be just a dead instrument. It ought to be a living instrument fashioned to meet a particular country. We have, yes, you can borrow from outside, but you must tailor it in order to suit your particular circumstances. Certainly, there are a number of things you can do in your constitution. I mentioned last time that we should embody within the constitution really not just rights and freedoms, but also civic responsibilities of a citizen. So you have duties and responsibilities and not just rights and freedoms. And that goes for the whole country, but you get a counterbalance. At the moment, we don't do that. And that really is the difference between ourselves and many countries that have succeeded because in fact, into you draw out an ethos relating to people being uh, um, patriotic, 
having a national vision and it becomes very important. So what about the politics? What about the constitution that is inhibiting the potential for harmony? And if you look at it, which I, I therefore I come back to my mixed form of PR, I must confess, is that what, what happens right now, each of the main parties has an ethnic base that it could rely on. And if I can rely on an ethnic base, it doesn't care who the hell I put in, in a particular seat. I can rely on my, and that's what, you know, Prime Minister Eric Williams said early on, I could put a crapo in a seat, <laughs> I put a balise tie on, and they're gonna vote for him. And that is the reality today. So you have this ethnic base following each political party. And what does that do therefore? The quality of representation doesn't really matter. On the other hand, if you draw into the mix, a mixed form of PR, where you have a representative for each constituency, which I think the people want, because you want to be able to relate to somebody. If I have a problem, I can go to my parliamentary representative. And he's not just a representative for the whole country. He's a representative for my constituency. So you have that. And then you have another focus where you have PR under which people are chosen from a list. What will happen? I have no doubt, given our past where you had 23% a block not winning any votes, is that whoever is representing that block will get a significant 23% uh, of the seats that remain in the parliament to be allocated. That will, in my mind, cause uh, people, I, I know some people are anti-coalition government. I do think that I, I would set the threshold for entry into parliament fairly high, certainly at the beginning, because you don't want so many splinter parties that you're not enabled to have strong government, because you want strong government at the end of the day. If governments just are unable to focus on what they want to implement because they're too much, uh, you know, too much back and forth because of these small parties. And that's what you see happening in Israel, by the way. So I would put a threshold to start maybe of 10% to gain a seat in parliament. But it does mean, yes, you will have to have more than likely a coalition. Yes, the people can vote for one dominant party, but they win 50%, more than 50%, that's possible. You haven't ruled that out. But because you have coalition, then each of the dominant parties needs to try and attract this 23%. It needs to blend its philosophy, if you like, its vision with whoever, and that, that 23% can move from one to the other, whoever they feel best enabled to, to accomplish the goals and vision of that party. And therefore, I, I certainly think, I mean, one doesn't know what will happen until you put it into practice. But then the dominance of the ethnic voter base, to my mind, will be transformed because you, you, by definition, you need a mixed coalition partner and you just cannot, you, you will have then in that, in that context, particularly for the national vote, where you, you choose by, by a list, you will have to put up people who you consider, who the population as a whole will consider of demonstrable quality and capability and competence. Right now, we, we say, well, we could do that through the Senate. But of course, we don't know who the members of the Senate will be. So how can I assess your capability when I don't know who you're going to put into the Senate? Whereas this will, a list system would compel you to put forward your list, would compel you to choose people that the national community will see as having a track record of competence, capability, and will actually seek to follow a vision. Unless we get that sort of unity, I, I think that we will, there are other things that one has to do, but from a constitutional point of view, 
I think that is what will take us towards that goal. Right, right. Um, now, now both of both of you have have spoken about um, the executive dominance, and 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 that's an issue that that has been raised. Um, but I I want to explore it a little further in the Guyanese case because it's something that uh, in even in the Caribbean we don't really uh, understand fully. And it, I I mean I have to say it, it it's a it's a sinister development that that occurred, and I'd really appreciate Ralph's. Um, Ralph's input, but but I mean, he, he spoke about the fear in 1973. I mean, now for me, the you would have lived through this, Ralph, so so you can um, uh, you know explain it more. But but you know, I I'm aware of about you know the House of Israel that was brought in down to sort of terrorize the the population. These these, these cults, you know, Jim Jones was just part of of all the cults that were being. But, you know, part of that atmosphere in, in Guyana in the 1970s and the, the murder of Walter Rodney in, in um, 1980. Um, and, and so so within this sort of atmosphere um, that was there and the executive dominance, there, I believe it was in the 1980 constitution, or I think it was actually before in 78, maybe at a, a party congress of the PNC, where they had a principle called party paramountcy which is actually very much like communist China. But whereas the party is above the state itself, where, you know, so the party flag would be flying uh, above the parliament. I, I understood that happened. And where the party, because just, just to put it on the table, in China, for example, uh, the Republic of China is actually in Taiwan. Uh, the, the communist party is above the state in China. The 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 army, the, the the People's Liberation Army, is not the army of China. It is the army of the Communist Party. Um, I, so th this is you know something very different from Western liberal democracy, um, uh, and and this is a kind of thing that the PNC were looking to to impose. And I know in the seventies Mao was very influential among the left, even in Trinidad uh, and Tobago. It, uh, certain parties were very Maoist um, oriented. Um, so yes, yeah, so this idea of party par paramountcy, where the, where the party is actually above the state and it was formalized. I mean, yes, we, we kind of have that notion here where, you know, in Trinidad they say, great is the PNM and it shall prevail. And it's like the party interest is above the national interest. But, but that level that reached in Guyana is, is, I've always been very curious and hardly anything has been written on it. It's just a little bit from my analysis over the years I've been adding together. If you can elaborate on that, uh, uh, elaborate on that for us, I'd greatly appreciate it. Well, what really happened was that the PNC started to go, they transitioned from pro-United States um, policy, from a complete pro-United States political party in 1964 um, when they came to power. Um, and then after 1968, when they rigged the elections and entered political office, they started to drift to the left. And you remember Nixon went to China and N Nixon opened up relations with China and Nixon had, they had, they had relations with the USSR in terms of um, arms control treaties and so on. So things began to open up a little bit and, born, and the Black Power movement, which you experienced in Trinidad, was, um, had become very popular in countries like Guyana, Trinidad and elsewhere. So Barnum, what Barnum did, he didn't go socialist. He didn't go left socialist. He went left, um, left Black Power. Uh, so adopted the Black Power um, um, strategy and then that transitioned into um, a, a political strategy. So several things happened. One, taking the cue from Nixon, Guyana opened diplomatic relations with China and they stick their finger into the eye of the United States by later opening relations with Cuba. And he was able to get Eric Williams and, and, and um, uh, Errol Barrow and somebody else yeah. do so at the same time. So it was in that era, and the, the year was 1974, 
when he had triumphed in the 1973 elections, mm -hmm. he had rigged those elections and got two thirds majority. So he felt that the all powerful. And he then transitioned to left Marxist, Marxist mm -hmm. left. Yeah. Now he didn't declare that, but it was clear that was the direction he was going into. There was a nationalization already of the bauxite industry. He, I can't remember exactly when he did nationalize the sugar, but it was around that time. So everything was pointing in the direction of the Marxist left. And all the communist countries in the world at the time, we used to call them socialist countries at that time, yeah. but all those communist countries had the same system. The party was in was 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 superior to the state. Right. So it's not only China, all over, USSR, the whole of Eastern Europe, Cuba, right. everybody else. So all Barnum did was make a declaration, did nothing else. They passed no laws. They made a declaration and they implemented policies. So you have to be a party member to get a job, to get any benefits. To, and so that so was on. official. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about that here, that you need your party card, but it's not official. But you're saying in Guyana, it was official. You had to be a party member to get state employment. Is that is that right? No, no, no. Oh, no, okay. no. Oh, no, no. Okay, you, okay. But you won't get state employment if you didn't have a party card. <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> Unlikely. Right. Okay, <laughs> but it's not official. Officially, in the front, there was no, yeah. officially, there was no political or racial discrimination okay. in employment be or anything. Because, because in, in Eastern Europe and, and China, you have to be a Communist Party member too. That's official in those countries. Yes, exactly. So I just wanted to know the extent. It wasn't official here. But you see, there was a, there was a judge called, um, 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 the judge called Appeal Judge, um, uh, Crane, um, um, he wasn't chancellor, but he was a court of appeal judge. Crane was a highly respected judge, Victor Crane. He was a court of appeal judge. His father was 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 an appellate judge. Um, I was a highly respected judge. I appeared before him many, many times. He um, he said that in a public speech to the University of Guyana, that judges must adopt the socialist ideology in 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 um, in in uh, in giving their decisions because that's the ideology of the state. So there was no law, but you know, important people like that yeah. made those statements. Right. right, right. Wow. Now we're, we're coming to the end of the program, unfortunately. There's, there's so much to, to talk about and so much that, that we don't even know about our neighbors. But, but I would like Tim, Timothy to reflect on that in the Trinidadian situation. Um, and then at the same time, I'll give you the opportunity to kind of wrap up and give it takeaway thoughts. And then, uh, Ralph, I'll let you do that too. But, but Timothy, uh, give your reflections on that, you know, extreme partisanship, par party paramountcy in Trinidad and, and so forth. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that it, it extends to the extent that, that Ralph mentions. What you do have in Trinidad, which again is an inhibiting factor, that doesn't allow us to grow, we really have a patronage society. If you want to get something done, you have to know somebody who knows somebody who could ask a, a favor. And that certainly not, should not be your goal. Your goal really ought to be that everybody has an equal opportunity to get services from the state. And we've turned it upside down. It, it's really, and no country really prospers if that's if you have it, it, that sort of system. So you, you, from top to bottom, it's riddled right through the public service, right through anything you want to do. You know, you have to know somebody who knows somebody or knows somebody directly to get something done. Uh, and I'm not sure that it, uh, what, what that opens itself up to is corruption. And no country certainly can succeed if it has a foundation of corruption. And that's why um, in, in 1986, what was what his name? PNM minister said, all are we teeth. Yeah. Um, because you, you Carty, Carty, definitely. Carty, Carty. Carty. You know, what you've done is, created 
you know, a monster, a monster. And we need to focus on changing that because a patronage society gets you nowhere fast. Right, and right. you cannot aspire to the dreams and goals and vision that you want to acquire, that you want to have. If yeah. that if we continue that, and it's it's yeah. difficult. I'm not saying it's an easy task, but we need to begin the journey. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent um, closing uh, thought there. How about you, Ralph? What would be your final takeaway thought? Well, I, I would like to say the following: that that is that, regardless of the politics, our own personal politics, and so on, relations between Trinidad and Guyana are very important. Um, between our two countries, and our countries have had traditionally good relations. Um, you know, it, Trinidad helped Guyana out in the 70s. Many Guyanese live in Trinidad. Um, also, Trinidad gave Guyana credit for its oil. Trinidad was one of the biggest um, um, debt, uh, yeah, one to of the biggest on debt the Paris debt Club. In, on the, the Paris Club, the, the, the uh, relief of that there was about 400 million US dollars so yeah and, and Prime Minister Manning remained engaged remained engaged with Guyana after 1992 mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and and during his terms of office so so it's very important for Guyana and Trinidad to you know, to maintain good relations what is happening now because of the Guyana oil oil find? oil discoveries and the development of its oil industry. Lots and lots and lots of Trinidad business people are here and keep coming to um, invest in, 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 in supplying the, the oil industry in which they have, as you know, lots of ex expertise. There was some, some complaints, you know, um, <laughs> by a Guyanese, uh, envious Guyanese, I must say, a little yeah. earlier. But, um, you know, I wrote about it, actually, and said that Trinidad business people are welcome here. Where, who are we going to bring? English people, Americans, when we have Trinidadians right here to, to help us out? Uh, and Trinidad needs a brace at this time because its economy, you know, is having difficulties. So that's important for us. The second thing that's important for our countries is that we, we, we try to resolve our ethnic problem. It's more serious in Guyana than in Trinidad. And this discussion has been very useful in bringing some clarity to that situation, how we can go about doing it. We have different approaches, slightly different ideas. The ethnic problem is more intense in Guyana than in Trinidad. But the discussion over parliament shows that we have a lots of common problems. And these discussions should continue so that we can discover new ideas in how we can go about resolving our problems. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. You know that uh, on that issue, I want to take the opportunity because I, I was involved in in the um, in, in in the impasse uh, in trying to resolve the impasse of the last elections. Uh, um, with the Turkey and um, Polling and Research Institute. And uh, one of the suggestions I made there was that, you know, we've had so many constitution commissions and um, ethnic relations commissions in Trinidad. I, I was part of, of, of both an ethnic one and a constitution one with the government here. And, um, and you have had many in Guyana. And it's like over and over and over, great recommendations, never implemented. I think if both countries, Trinidad and Guyana, put together a collective commission for both of our countries, I think that would be a very interesting thing because we'd see each other with fresh eyes and without the, 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 the personal tensions that, that may exist. I, I think that could provide a breakthrough. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I, I think that perhaps um, we should think of, of yeah, two but... countries looking to solve its constitutional and ethnic problems. I think right through the Caribbean, huh, there's yeah. opportunities. Quite frankly, do we need all these central banks? Do we need all these securities commissions? Do we need driving license, different driving licenses? Mm -hmm. You know, if you brought on the pool of expertise, you could draw from yeah. a larger basin of people yeah. would allow them to be really professional and lessen the tensions of 
you know, who that's right. The personal history all, from small day. islands. Yeah, and there's a lot that we need to get here in, in the Caribbean to perhaps unify, that can be unified with the will, political will, Excellent. and will transform. Well, I want to thank uh, both of you so much for this fascinating and interesting discussion. It's been a pleasure having you both on the program. Thank you very much, Kirk. I appreciate being thank here. You. Welcome thank to the opportunity to come again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's episode of A Story Club Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. We were talking with our guests, Ralph Ramkaran from Guyana and Timothy Hamill Smith from Trinidad and Tobago on constitutions of Guyana versus Trinidad and Tobago, ethnicity, PR, democracy, and social cohesion. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for watching and listening. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, like, share, follow, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. And if you're watching on YouTube, please also click the bell icon so you get notifications of when our programs are uploaded. Thanks again and see you next week.